Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Maya 101 class for Thursday, June the 21st, I believe, 2012. Today we are going to be taking a look at Maya in sort of a crash course sense. I'm going to be introducing you guys to Maya under the assumption that you haven't used it at all before. Basically that you're a complete newcomer and that you're kind of terrified of Maya. In fact, that's really my ideal student right now, is somebody who looks at the Maya interface and gets scared and kind of wants to close it and go watch cartoons for a while, because I totally understand how you feel. Now, I do have several things that I have to go over because this is our first class. Uh, just some things about how the class is going to work, as well as just a few generic announcements. The first announcement I'm going to make is that if I don't, I, I don't know how many of you ever listened to my vo videos or, or attended any of my classes, but if I don't sound completely like myself today, I do apologize. I am getting over a fairly nasty case of bronchitis, and uh, I am thoroughly medicated at the moment, so I'm going to be keeping my voice down right now. If for some reason you hear my mic suddenly go dead, uh, give me just a moment. I'm probably just muted so that I can get a good cough out, and then I'll uh, be back in just a moment. So, uh, anyways, let's talk about this class, uh, because I, some of you were not here for Tuesday's class, and if you weren't here for Tuesday's class, you haven't seen it yet, because I did not get a chance to put up the videos yet. I do apologize for that, for those of you who are counting on those videos being up by now. Uh, I spent most of yesterday at the doctor's office, uh, at the walk-in clinic, and it just took me forever to get in and out of there, and when I got back... I, it just totally slipped my mind. So it's totally my fault, and I do apologize. Uh, but I've got them all encoded and uploaded. I just need to get them into the database and get those all set live. And then you'll be able to watch Tuesday's class, as well as today's, if you so desire. Now, I will mention this. Uh, if you have to duck out for any reason today, if you're already here, you will get credit for attending today's class. So don't think that you have to stay for the whole thing. However, if... Uh, if you're familiar with the way some of our classes have gone in the past, I am going to be working pretty hard. Oh, somebody says my screen's not up. That's okay. There wasn't much to see anyway. Uh, just this. So there's my screen, everybody. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, uh, as I was saying, I am going to be working very hard to keep this going uh, to about two hours. Uh, so if we run a little bit over, that's fine, but uh, for a lot of reasons involving having to get um, other classes going, and I do have another class uh, tonight at 7 p.m. So anyway, let's talk about this class. So can everybody see my screen now? Just quick update. You can tell me over inside of BuzzNet. Oh, look, everybody can see me. Hello. Okay, that's good. Now, uh, some things about how this class actually works. First off, let's talk about BuzzNet. BuzzNet is a little web application. You do not need to download it. There's nothing you actually need to install on your end. You just need to point your browser to buzznet.3dbuzz.com, which hopefully you have all already done. It seems like you all have, because the counts are matching up pretty well. It is still kind of in a beta state, so if on occasion you find yourself needing to refresh the page and log back in, then I apologize for that. It does happen. Uh, BuzzNet is our means by which we chat with students and allow students to chat with each other. Now, it's also uh, the way that we keep track of who is participating along with the class. Now, today, that will not be super critical, because really today, I am walking you through the interface of Maya and introducing you to a lot of Maya's features, but we are not actually going to be working on a project today. That's going to start with the next session. Today is really just a crash course uh, to get people up to speed and get them familiarized with Maya. That's my goal for today. But as we get into participation, you'll notice you have a participate button up at the top of BuzzNet, and you can click on that, and it will change your state for me so that I know who's participating and who isn't. And we'll be uh, working with that as we get deeper into the class. Now, a couple of other things. If you have an official question for me, if you have a concern, if I'm working and you want to say, how did you do that, or if you have anything that I really need to address uh, during the lecture, please don't put it into BuzzNet, because BuzzNet's full of chatter, and I will often lose things or uh, I'll miss something. So if you have an official question, please take a look over at the webinar system that you are running right now. You should see a question section where you can put up a question. Please make sure that you put official questions into the webinar system and not inside of BuzzNet. Conversely, if you just have something to say, even if it's just like, you know, hey, thank you, or high five, or whatever, 
please do that inside of BuzzNet. Please try to keep the question system uh, clean and available just for the asking of official questions, and everything will run much more smoothly. Okay, next. Weekly schedule. I already saw some people asking about this just a little bit earlier. This class uh, runs twice a week, and both of the sessions are identical. So the Tuesday class and the Thursday class are both going to be going over the same content. It's just a convenience factor for more people to be able to actually watch uh, the sessions live. You are not restricted to just attending the Tuesday or the Thursday session. You can attend both if you so desire. Just, uh, you know, if you need to duck out early one day and you want to pick up the rest later on, then you can just log back into the next session, or you can watch the videos because all of these sessions are recorded. So if you ever have to leave, don't worry. We are recording this. In fact, everything I'm saying right now is being recorded and will be put up uh, for streaming. Now, <laughs> that said, again, I do apologize for not having Tuesday's sessions up just a little bit earlier. That was mostly due to me spending most of yesterday at the hospital and just totally forgetting about it. So once again, you have my apologies for that. Next, certificates. Everybody will like certificates. They're pretty cool. And uh, you will get one for completing this class, but there are some criteria that you must meet in order to be eligible for a certificate. I do want to mention these certificates are digital. We are not going to mail you a piece of paper uh, just to save on postage, save some trees, etc. and so forth. Uh, we will give you a high resolution print quality file that you are more than welcome to print on your own if you so desire. But to get a certificate, you have two things you need to do. One is you have to meet the attendance requirement. And that's simple. Just attend half of the weekly sessions. And uh, if you were here on Tuesday and you're here today as well, that only counts for one day. So keep that in mind. It's on a week-by-week -week basis. So if you make it to three of the six weeks, then you've met the attendance requirements. So we're actually very flexible in that regard. If for some reason you're not going to be able to attend all of the classes, you know, PM me. Uh, and I'll see if I can work with you. I'll do everything I can to make this as easy on you guys as I can. Uh, next. The other criteria is you have to complete all of the homework. There will be homework assignments for every week except this week. This one week I'm going a little bit easier on you guys and you are not having a homework assignment. Uh, partially because I am just spending today's session introducing you to the bare bone basics of Maya and getting you involved in its interface for what I'm going to have to assume is the very first time. Uh, your unofficial assignment, nothing, nothing that you can actually turn in, nothing you can actually, uh, that I can quantify, is to make sure that you play with Maya between now and next week so that once we get in, we can jump right into our project without you feeling too terribly intimidated by what we're doing. Now that said, while I work, I always go over all of the buttons and you know, hotkeys or any settings that I'm using just so that you can follow along exactly. But the more comfortable you are with the interface, the more uh, comfortable you are with navigating through the 3D viewport, etc. It's just going to make everything that you do in Maya significantly easier. So that's going to be the big goal for today, is to get you up and going so that you are comfortable with what Maya looks like and you can start moving things around within it. Okay, so a couple of other things. We're not quite done yet. I have a teacher's assistant for this class, or a TA, as you might have heard the term. The TA for this class is NATO, or Chris Morris, and this is his username over on 3D Buzz. He's going to be the person you will be contacting to get your Dropbox set up for your homework. All homework assignments will be submitted to us via Dropbox. That means if you need to, Go over to Dropbox.com and set up a free account. You don't really need anything particular. Um, it's totally free. Uh, all they ask for is an email address, and you get two free gigs. Two gigs is more than enough to handle all of our homework. 
Uh, now, somebody just asked, uh, Paul just asked, is homework separate from what is done in a lesson, or would following a lesson be the homework? That is actually handled on a case-by-case basis. Uh, sometimes I have made assignments where it's more or less, if you have followed along and you've done everything, then you're essentially already done with your assignment. Uh, often, though, I will ask you to do something other than uh, than what we handled in class. So... Uh, definitely keep that in mind. Now, um, if if you're signing up for Dropbox, I think Wick just had a really nice point. Uh, he said, I wonder if there's someone we should refer. <laughs> uh, actually, I did that for several of the people who signed up, and I got a whole lot of free space because of it. But um, but I don't really need it anymore because I've actually switched everything that I do over to Google Drive. We just use Dropbox because it's already established. So be sure you, uh, you make a Dropbox account. If you need a... Um, if you need a referral to get a, I think they do now an extra half a gig when you get referred. And I'm sure you can talk to one of your classmates who probably already has an account and they'll refer you and both of you can get some free space. And that's always very cool. So be sure to do that. Now, that said, I do want to point something out real quick regarding these classes. There is a thread over in the member sponsor lounge. It's a sticky. And I know that sticky threads generally get ignored by everybody. But if you go to the member sponsor lounge up in the stickies right now, like the third thread down is the live classes homework submission steps. Please take a moment and read this thread. You need to read this thread. It is going to walk you through how to get your uh, Dropbox account all set up properly so that we can grade your assignments. Now, again, your TA for this class is NATO or Chris Morris, you can click on his name here in this thread and automatically send him a PM. So really all you have to do for this PM is put in uh, your email for your Dropbox account. So whatever email you're using for Dropbox, just send that to them with the appropriate, uh, the appropriate subject line and you'll be good to go. So that's no big deal. Just please make sure you remember this thread. And it would be a really good idea. In fact, we'll just kind of consider that uh, officially slash unofficially your homework for next week is go ahead and get your Dropbox account set up for next week uh, so that we don't have to worry about them later. Okay, so that takes care of that. Now, what else? There's one last thing that I want to mention. And it has to do with the fact that you're staring at this well, I lovingly call it the whiteboard, but we all know what color it really is. But I want to talk to you about taking notes. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody does it. But I highly recommend that you all get a pen and a piece of paper. Go ahead, kill a tree, and write things down. One of the biggest reasons that I write stuff down here on this whiteboard is partially to drive it home, because I think this is a really good way to teach. Actually, seeing somebody write something out does something in your brain, and you remember it. Uh, a bit better. But the fact that I'm taking time to write something down should be generally a giveaway to you that you should probably be writing it down too, because in this way you can build your own study guide uh, so that you don't ever forget anything. Okay, so that's everything about how this class works. Are, and if yeah, if you want to use print screen and all those little cool tricks like that, that's totally fine. Uh, me, personally, I'm a big proponent of actually taking the effort to write something down. I find that if I write something down, I remember it uh, much more cleanly. In fact, in my particular case, if I take the time to take notes, I generally don't need the notes at that point because writing it down means that I'm probably going to remember it, but that's just me. Okay, so now, are there any questions so far about how the class works? Anything I didn't cover that you need me to mention? Um, you've all figured out how the live class calendar works over on 3D Buzz. Please refer to, to that for all videos, for all passwords, etc. and so forth. I'm not seeing any questions come up, so let's talk about today's class. Today is really all about the Maya Crash Course. I can't make you a Maya Pro in one day, uh, much less uh, in a, a two-hour training session, but I can get you up and running in the interface and make you significantly more comfortable than you were to begin with. But I do have a question for you. Who here in the audience right now, and you can just answer inside of BuzzNet, uh, who is a complete and total Maya noob? And just hasn't played with the application before, you're just not a Maya person one bit. Is there anybody in here? You can just tell me. There's one, there's a couple, okay. Just a couple, all right. Uh, how many of you are 
only a little bit familiar with Maya. And don't be shy. Just just respond in BuzzNet. This is how I talk to you guys. Okay, I got some folks who've used it just a little, and that's totally cool. My uh, target audience for today's lecture is really people who have never touched Maya before. Now, if you have touched it before, all I can hope for is that you're going to get more out of it uh, than you knew previously. And I see some folks who are going through the Maya Fundamentals class, and that's great. Uh, there are some definitely some uh, some good lessons buried inside of the Maya Fundamentals class. And I'll, do, I'll be honest, most of them, nearly all of them actually, uh, still hold up to this day. Uh, the only thing is, of course, you have a slightly different interface, and things are kind of separated a bit differently throughout Maya's UI. All that said, though, everything that we did in, in the fundamentals will generally still hold up, even today, which is great, and that makes me very happy. But this class is really for those who are completely new to Maya, and even if you've been playing with it, maybe you're just looking for something to kind of get you up to speed here in 2013. So what are we going to be talking about today? I want to give you a quick list that you can use kind of like a checklist. We're going to start with the very, very basics. We're going to talk about uh, 3D space and how it pertains to Maya. Uh, this is important in general, but it's even more important if, you've, if you're coming to Maya from other 3D applications or even other 3D game engines such as Unity or UDK. Uh, along with that, we're going to be uh, talking about the three axes. Uh, we're going to talk about Maya's UI user interface. We're going to talk about the viewport. I know it's part of the UI, but it's such a special part of the UI that it actually kind of does deserve its own discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about working with 3D objects. We're going to take a look at object mode versus component mode. We'll take a look at parenting and how that works inside of Maya. And no, it's it's not going to be like a sex ed class. It's actually pretty straightforward. I'm sorry. I think I'm funny. It's a terrible affliction. Uh, we are going to take a look at Maya's node-based architecture. We're going to look at the, and this kind of goes along with this, we're going to look at the scene hierarchy. versus the DAG, or the Directed Acyclic Graph. And then we're going to close off by giving you an overview of construction history, which is an important concept inside of Maya. Now, I did just happen to glance, somebody ask about, uh, about hotkeys and whatnot. Hotkeys will come while we work. I'm not necessarily going to take a lesson where I just show you all the different hotkeys. Uh, mostly because, I'll be honest, I don't use all of them. Uh, some hotkeys speak to me and some I, I just can't live without, but there's others, and there's plenty of others out there that I generally don't touch. And really, that's just kind of a, a workflow thing. Is there a proposed project for this class, or are there many projects? I'm thinking of the golfer for Blender, so that's why I ask. There is a project for this class that we will be going through. Uh, we will not be actually seeing it today. Uh, one of the reasons is I actually have to uh, condense things a little bit in this class. As those of you who might have gone through the Blender class will recall, there was a free Blender session uh, that we held before the Blender 101 class. We didn't do that in this case. Uh, so what I'm doing today is kind of tackling what would have been covered in that free session, and then we'll kind of move on from there. I will give you guys an overview of that project. We will talk about it at the end of class before we wrap up. Uh, but uh, starting on next Tuesday and next Thursday, we'll actually get to see a bit more of that project, and we'll actually start working on it. So there you go. All right. So now, uh, and somebody just said it would be nice to get some kind of most used hotkeys cheat sheet. Um, you know, start writing them down, because I'm going to tell you all of the hotkeys that I use uh, more often than anything else. So uh, if you are being a good little student, like I suggested earlier, and you have a pen and paper, you're going to be writing those down anyway, and you will have your own cheat sheet, which is pretty amazing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about briefly is the concept of 3D space. Now, I'm going to go kind of under the assumption that this is not something you guys are completely alien to, that you've all seen uh, 3D space in some you know, form or fashion. But in terms of Maya, 3D space is an important concept to at least talk about for just a moment. And it's pretty straightforward. I mean, in 2D space, if you have like a two-dimensional grid, which I'll just kind of rough one out real quick, 
you'll generally have two axes. You have one axis going horizontally, which is usually x, and then one axis going vertically, which is usually the y-axis. Of course, in 3D space, you end up with a third axis being the z-axis. The funny thing about Maya is that it handles the z-axis a little differently than some other applications. And by other applications, I mean Blender, I mean 3ds Max, I mean UDK, and that is that you have the x-axis, and well, even I screw it up sometimes. You have the z-axis and you have the y-axis. The y-axis actually points up, and that is a really important concept to be aware of. Uh, inside of 3ds Max, the z-axis is actually what points up. And that would, I'll just write down, that would be in Max, that would be in UDK, that would be in Blender. Now, all that said, you can make Maya use a z-up coordinate system. I generally do not recommend that you do this. There are several tools that I have run into over the years that when you switch Maya over to a Z-Up system uh, will give you a little bit of grief because it seems like they were coded with the coordinate system generally pointing uh, with Y up. So if I was in your shoes, I would get used to Y being up. Now if you're you know, concerned about, you know, well, what if I'm taking a character or, or something over into something like uh, UDK, which has a Z-Up world? Don't be alarmed and don't stress. Uh, in every case that I can think of, every important case that I've ever been exposed to anyway, the outputting system, however you're exporting your, uh, your object out, will have some sort of conversion. And if, it's, if not that, then it'll be converted on the import on the far side. So I've never actually run into that being a problem because everybody knows that different pieces of software use different uh, coordinate systems. So Maya is Y up. That's the big thing I want you to be aware of because it can throw you for a loop. And I'm a big fan of knowing what direction your axes are pointing in and not just kind of playing it by ear. There are a lot of people who I've seen when they first get into 3D, they just kind of, oh, well, you know, I just need to move something up. I don't really care about the axis. You know, the, the axis that it's moving in. I, just, I know I need to move it up or to the left or forward or back. And I'm very much against that. So definitely keep uh, keep track of what direction your axes are pointing. And yeah, I already see some people, uh, streeters, saying, I'm so used to Z-Up, this is going to throw me off so many times. It's really not that bad, I promise. Uh, in fact, if, if anything, you'll, you'll be kind of maybe a little disorientated for, you know, the first hour or so, and then it, it's, it'll just go away. Really, if anything's going to bother you, like if you're coming to this from any other application, be it Blender or, or, or Max or UDK or, or anything, the only thing that's probably going to throw you for a loop is navigating the viewport. That's the most frustrating thing ever, is remembering how viewport navigation works between different applications. I call it navigation syndrome, and it bites me in the face every single time I go from one app to another. It'll probably bite me in the face later today, because as soon as I get in with this class, i got to go teach a Blender class, and everything's totally different over there. Okay, so there's your basics of 3D space. I also want to mention this, and it's not anything I really need you to dwell on. It's not something I need you to really be concerned about, but just something so that you know it, is that by default, Maya units are centimeters. Of course you can change that. You can make Maya's units uh, kilometers or meters or feet or inches or whatever you want. Just know that by default, if you haven't changed any of your settings, the default units are in centimeters. So if you're just building in a default installation of Maya and you export to some other application and something is smaller or larger than you thought it was, that's what you should be keeping in mind, is that Maya has been building in centimeters the whole time. So there you go. Okay, so there's our quick rundown of 3D space. And I just want to jump over to Maya real quick. And it's two clicks to go to Maya right now. And you can actually see this. Now, you don't have to worry about what I'm doing in Maya. You don't have to worry about the viewport, though you probably already know, you know, probably how to move things around at least a little bit. But take a look in the lower left-hand corner, and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. How we have the x-axis pointed out to the side. We have the z-axis pointing forward, or that's how I like to think of it anyway. And then the y-axis pointing straight up. And again, for those of you coming to this from other directions, that's probably going to be the biggest thing uh, that will throw you for a loop. Uh, now, uh, Paul just asked, in this course, should we switch our settings to centimeters as well? Ah, I don't really care. If you have uh, already switched it to something else, uh, then you can really leave it there. You're not going to be exporting anything out. The only thing you're going to be doing is building a scene, animating it a bit, and then rendering. And I'm not going to be doing much by way of exact units anyway. And anything that I do, if you know you've changed the, your 
uh, your settings, like let's say you know that you've changed centimeters to inches for some reason, I'm going to leave it up to you to know how to convert that. But I mean, really, uh, if, if you just go with direct proportion, something that is, uh, you know, if I build a two centimeter object over here and then a five centimeter object over here, and you build one that's two inches and five inches, you know, the proportions are going to be dead on, and we're not going to be able to tell one from the other during a render, so I wouldn't stress about it at all. Now that I've beaten that horse thoroughly into the ground, uh, that covers the, the whole idea of 3D space, which takes us to the Maya user interface. Now I'm going to ask an honest question here. Who, who in the room, uh, and you can just answer right there inside of BuzzNet, who has seen the Maya user interface and just become scared out of your wits? Who's really intimidated by this interface? Just let me know. Give me a yes and don't be afraid because it, it doesn't surprise me at all. Hand up. There's a couple of people. Okay, good. Uh, sort of. And we all were, you know, some people aren't. Some people have have seen this kind of stuff before um, in, you know, Flash or maybe all the way back to the days of Director. And I'll be, I'll, I'll tell you straight up, this interface is really not that bad once you break it up. And that's the big thing is you've got to know how to break it up in your head so that you know generally what you're looking at and you know the general tasks of all these different pieces. Now, as I walk you through the interface, be aware that we are only seeing a small portion of the Maya UI. Most of it is actually hidden away. And as we go through this class and as we tackle different parts of our project, we're going to see different parts of that UI. We're going to expose them and use them. So for now, my goal is to get you uh, up to speed with what's right here in front of you. And then as we move forward, uh, we will uh, we'll go into those other parts of the user interface and we'll explain how those work as well. So let's start off over here in Photoshop, what I'm going to do is pretend that I was learning this for the first time. And this is generally what I do. Whenever I'm learning a new user interface in any application, I will get out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I will do a quick sketch of the interface so I know what's what, so I can make notes of what is where. So, across the top, we have a menu bar. Just like every other application you've ever seen in your life. Now what I'm going to do real quick, before we even start talking about what anything does, I'm going to give you a quick breakdown of the primary sections of the interface along with their names. And I would like you, if you can, to try to commit these names to memory. Uh, and I know it may take a little bit of time, but I want to be able to say, you know, look at the status line and you know exactly where to look. Or I tell you to look at the timeline and you know exactly where to look, etc. So that'll be my goal here, which is why I'm writing all this stuff out. So we have a menu bar. Directly underneath the menu bar, we have the status line. At first glance, that's going to look like a toolbar, but it is not a toolbar. Underneath that, and a little bit thicker, we have the shelf. Now, because of the way the interface is laid out, I'm actually going to jump downwards a little bit to the bottom. Across the bottom, we have... Excuse me, thank you. I have to write kind of small here. We have the time slider. Underneath that, we have the range slider. And I'll point all this stuff out here in just a minute. So don't be alarmed, do not panic. We have the command line. I can't spell command, by the way, so please feel free to snicker behind your hand. And we have the helpline. Now, on the left-hand side, and if you guys are wondering, I'm not holding the shift key. My hand really is that steady. Uh, we have the toolbox. And then over here on the side, we have a couple of different panels that could be up for a variety of reasons. We have the channel box and layer editor. Or we may be looking at the attribute editor. Now, of course, the great big area here in the middle, this is going to be our viewport. 
So that's a quick rundown of the layout of the interface. Now let's take a look at that in the real world over inside of Maya. So we have the menu bar up across the very top. Directly underneath that, we have the status line. And I'll be going over each one of these in a bit of depth. So this is the status line. Then we have the shelf, which has got all these great tabs and a whole bunch of buttons. Buttons hidden behind tabs of other buttons. Down from here on the left, we have the toolbox. Currently, we see the channel box and layer editor, which is nicely labeled, so you don't have to worry about which one you're looking at. If you were looking at the attribute editor, it would say attribute editor. So, it, and it is tabbed as of I think Maya 2012, so you can quickly jump in between the two, which is pretty swanky, really. And then across the bottom, we have the time slider, which allows us to move forward in time, frame by frame. We have the range slider. We have the command line, and we have the help line. So that's your quick breakdown of what each one of these things are. Now let's talk about them in a little bit more depth, starting with probably the most boring feature of any user interface, which is the menu bar. But here's the great thing. Maya's menu bar is not boring. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite of boring. It is so detailed and so in-depth that it actually can't hold all of the different menus that it has. And so the menu bar has been broken up into what are called menu sets. And these menu sets are switchable by way of this drop down that you see on the left hand side of the, of the status line. So you'll see we have an animation menu set, we have a polygons menu set, we have a surfaces menu set, and so on and so forth. And each time we change between these menu sets, the menus are constantly updating and changing with us. Now you don't have to just use this drop down. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't think I ever click on this drop down unless I'm teaching somebody about the drop down. These are slave to hotkeys. Now I'll give you a, just a giveaway. If you hit the F1 key, this is going to open up Maya's help. Don't be afraid of this help. It's actually a really good help system. I've been quite impressed with how Autodesk has updated Maya's help and made it what it is today. Uh, so definitely don't fear the help file. But we have the F2 key, which takes us to the animation menu set. The F3 key, which takes us to the polygons menu set. This is useful if we are doing any polygon modeling. The F4 key takes us to surfaces or NURBS surfaces, if you've heard that term before. If you don't know what a NURBS surface is, do not be alarmed. A lot of folks don't, and you don't really need to worry about them right this minute anyway. It's just a different way of building a surface. Dynamics, where we can do things like particles, and we can do simulations, and hard bodies, and rigid bodies, and soft bodies, and all kinds of stuff like that. And we have the rendering menu set on F6. So it's F2 for animation, F3 for polygons, F4 for surfaces, F5 for dynamics, and F6 for rendering. Now there are a couple ones that aren't, uh, don't have a hotkey yet because they're fairly new. We have the N dynamics menu set, and this will give you uh, N particles, N mesh, N hair, etc. and so forth. So some of the new stuff that uh, is as of Maya 2012 and 2013. So definitely be aware of those. If you uh, end up hit like like I did when I first got my hands on Maya uh, 2013, I hit F5 and started looking for all of my um, all of my in particle stuff, and it just wasn't there. And I was like, "Oh, what's going on?" And I had to come over here and click on this because it's kind of frustrating to me. They over in the dynamics um, menu set, they actually have fluid N cache. There's something that has a letter N on it, so I mean that looks promising. But then they break all the really fun stuff up into its own hidden menu set. So. Definitely be aware of the secret menu set. Okay, so I do want to mention, even though the uh, the menu bar is constantly in a state of flux depending on what menu set you're in, there are some consistent menus that do not change. And I just want to point out what those are. And the, generally what you can expect to find in them. I'm not going to go uh, you know, kind of case by case and show you each and every single command that is inside each menu, but we have some constant menus. They're always available and those include file, edit, modify, create, display, window, asset, and the all-important help menu. Now the help menu jumps around because it's always at the very far right side. So as you jump between different menu sets, it will wiggle around a little bit, but it's, it is always there. 
Now, real quick, again, I don't want to go over each and every option underneath these menus, but just kind of as an overview. Files, you're going to have probably exactly what you think you should have in there. Uh, new scene, open scene, save, save as, import, export, and that sort of thing. You also have access to your recent files. Edit has undo and redo. Let's talk about undo and redo for just a second. Currently, the hotkeys, uh, as shown in the menu, are control Z and control Y for redo. That's cute. But I never use those because I'm kind of old school when it comes to Maya. I've been using it for a while. The old hotkeys for undo are still available. They haven't got rid of them yet, so I just at least want to tell you what they are. Uh, because they are, I don't know, I like it better than Control z You can just tap the Z key in Maya. So if you do something you didn't want to do, you can just tap Z and undo it. You don't have to hold control, you don't have to hold anything. You can just hit the Z key, which is very, very nice. If you need to redo something, you can hit Shift Z. So Z and Shift Z will undo and redo for you. Now, if you want to use Control Z and Control Y because you're used to doing that from 3ds Max or you know, pick your application. I think every other application in the world uses uh, Control Z and Control Y. Then you can do that. But uh, you know, I'm just so used to using Z and Shift Z. I thought I'd at least pass those to you so you knew what they were. Now, also under Edit, we have things like Cut, Copy, Paste. We can delete stuff. We can delete by type, which is really, really cool, uh, and you'll be using it a lot more than you probably think, uh, because this is where you go to delete any history on your objects. And we'll be talking about history a little bit later in today's class. You can do various forms of selection. You can duplicate, you can group and ungroup, and you can parent and unparent, all inside of the edit menu. Modify is a little different. Modify is all about changing things, as the name suggests. This is where you can go to get access to all of your transform tools if you want to. If you want to convert an object from one type of object to another, if you want to move the pivot point around, it's all about changing a given object in some way. Next, we have Create. I'll give you three guesses as to what this menu is here for, and the first two guesses don't count. It's really all about making stuff, uh, whatever you want to make. You want to make polygon stuff, you want to make subdivision surface stuff, you want to make lights, cameras, uh, you want to make some 3D text or, or you know, some form of text. It's all right here. Display. This is about what is showing on top of the user interface. Uh, so it's, it doesn't exactly change the bits of the user interface, so although that's, you know, that is kind of arguable because you can change the heads up display. So for example, I can go under heads up display and turn on poly count, and here's a breakdown of all the polygons, edges, verts, and faces, and so forth that are in my scene, which is very cool. And that does affect the user interface, but I also have some other things as well, like I can turn on uh, certain aspects of uh, polygon feedback. So for instance, if I want to see things like Oh, I'm, I don't know, face normals. Now it looks like my little sphere has hair, which it doesn't. This is just telling me what direction all of my polygons are facing. And you don't, you don't really have to worry about this or, and what all this means and how to turn all this on and off. I'm just kind of pointing it out to you. I'm going to go back under polygons, and I'm going to turn that back off like so. And then I'm going to go back under heads-up display and turn off poly count to go back to where I was. Uh, the goal, again, is just uh, be, that you can change what it is you're looking at and kind of the way you're visualizing it. The window menu is all about bringing up different windows of the user interface, different panels, if you will. And there are a lot of them that we haven't even touched on that you don't even see. For instance, we have the UV texture editor for laying out the UVs of a polygon or a NURBS object. Uh, we have things like the hypergraph or the hypershade. Uh, we have uh, the render globals. We have render settings. We have uh, the script editor. Or another one that you can actually uh, probably tear into right away, you can go under Window, Settings, Preferences, and open up your preferences. And you have access to all of the different preferences, and we'll actually be playing with a few of these uh, before we're done here, but take a look under Settings, and you can see where you can change the up axis between Y and Z. You can change your working units from centimeter to anything you want, and your time from 24 frames a second to whatever it is you need it to be. So this is the, one of your big places to go change the primary settings of Maya, if you need to for some reason. Now, I'm going to be leaving these all at defaults for the time being. Later on, once we get to animating, I might change our frames per second, or I might forget, and it won't matter. Um, but Because this is just kind of an, an introductory thing. But if you need to know where to change stuff, definitely do it. I'm just going to mention, just from personal experience, and I'll be perfectly honest, it's been a while, 
But the last time that I tried to take my up axis and set it to Z, I just found that there were certain tools which kind of misbehaved and things didn't quite work out the way that I wanted them to. I'm not saying that's still the case. They might have fixed that. But in the meantime, after I discovered that that happened, I really just got used to working in a Y up world. So I don't even think about it anymore. So just something for you to, to kind of dwell on. Okay. Now let's go ahead and close that out for now. So again, that's just the window setting. It just brings up different parts of the user interface. Assets is a little bit outside our scope for now, but the concept of an asset is that you can take an entire collection of stuff, being a character, his rig, all the different control parts for him, maybe any equipment that comes along with him, or maybe an entire set with all the different pieces for it. And you can make that into a single unit where you expose attributes on how it should work. Uh, and that's the, the really generic overview of what an asset is. And this is where you can control all of that. And then finally, you have help, which does exactly what you think it does. In fact, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have uh, access to tutorials, to the actual help file. You can go straight to the area, which is, of course, Autodesk's website. Uh, the Mel command reference, which is huge if you want to learn how to use Mel. So definitely a lot of stuff to be found in there. Okay, and somebody just asked about the view cube. You guys are probably seeing the view cube, because, but I have already turned it off, so let me go ahead and switch that back on and kind of grumble and, and whine for a minute. But, uh, but yeah, I'll definitely show what the view cube is all about here in just a little while. All right, so there is the menu bar at a glance. Now, of course, I'm not going to go over every single thing uh, having to do with the menu bar because it's broken up into so many different menu sets. We'd spend all day just talking about various menus. We've talked about the static ones, though, and I think you get the idea from toggling through the different menu sets as to the types of things you're going to find underneath each one. The big key, the big thing that you would need to, uh, to understand is that really what you're going to do is change your menu set based on the task you're currently performing. So if it's time to model out a character and you know that you're going to be modeling in polygons, you're going to want to switch to the polygons menu set. When you're done and you want to start rigging it up and animating it, you'll switch to the animation menu set. When that's all done, you want to add in some particle effects, you'll go to the dynamics or the in dynamics menu set, etc. and so forth. Now, things like uh, bonus tools and all that kind of stuff, the bonus tools is an additional installation, so I'm not even going to worry about it. Muscle is way outside the scope of what we're talking about in this class, pipeline cache, etc. That's all way outside of our scope uh, if you're just getting started. I am not going to do a 101 class where I teach you guys how to rig up a character with 3D muscles. Sorry to, to be a light down there. Okay, so now let's move on down to our next part of the user interface, which is the status line. Now, a lot of folks who are just getting into Maya will look at this and think that it is a toolbar. And it is not a toolbar. It is a status line. And the reason it's called a status line is because it's here to tell you the current state that Maya is in. If Maya is ever acting stupid, if you can't seem to select objects you think you should be able to select, if you can't seem to move objects the way you think they should be able to be moved, the first place your eyes need to cut to is up here to the status line and make sure that something isn't switched on that shouldn't be. So definitely keep that in mind. But here's a quick overview of the status line. Now starting on the left-hand side, we have our drop-down for the different menu sets. We've already seen how that works. We have a few buttons which make this work, kind of like a toolbar. We have a, a new scene button, we have an open scene button, and we have save the current scene button. I never use these. As a matter of fact, I spend most of my time with these collapsed because I just use control N for new scene, I use control O for open, and I use control S for save. So I don't worry about those ever for any reason. Next, we have some selection masks that we can dig through. These allow us to control what we can and cannot select at any given time. Now, right now, if you're just getting started out, I don't expect you to understand how useful that can really be. But later on, once you have things like a fully rigged character, which has bones, or well, actually joints inside of Maya, it has joints sticking out, and there's NURBS curves everywhere, and there's all these different assets all over the scene made of all kinds of different stuff. It is nice to be able to say, you know what, I just want to be able to select polygons and nothing else. That does make your life a whole lot easier to be able to control what you can and can't select. Now that said, you can do the same thing uh, in the next section over, just with a little more detail. You can choose to select by object type and select by component type. These are the two primary modes with which you can uh, manipulate objects, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. But notice, as I jump between these two buttons, all of these options update. And what these options do is allow you to control what is selectable right now and what isn't. For instance, we have surfaces here. It's currently highlighted. That's 
what it means when it's highlighted. You get a little gray box around it. If I turn that off for some reason, I can click on this sphere all day long and it will never select this sphere because I've turned off the ability to select surfaces. So if I click on the surface again to turn that back on, I can suddenly select that. So again, it's just a way to control what you can and can't select. That's while we are in object mode. Now, I will give you a heads up. You can mouse over any of these and you can see kind of what they're here for. Like for instance, select surface objects. But there's a lot of different surfaces available in Maya. We have things like uh, polygon surfaces, we have NURB surfaces, we have subdivision surfaces. Uh, we have all kinds of things, and what we can do is right-click here and choose which of those we actually want to be able to select at any given time. We can be a little more selective about it. So I can turn off poly surfaces. Notice this now turns orange. So now I can't select poly surfaces, but if I had something else in the scene, like a NURBS sphere, for instance, I could still select the NURBS surface, but not the polygon surface. So just be aware of how that works. Next, we have the ability to lock and unlock selections. So if you have something selected and you don't want to unselect it for any reason, or maybe you have nothing selected and you don't want anything to be selected right now, you want that all locked away, then you have a selection lock uh, right there. Next, we have highlight selection mode. And all that's going to do is uh, control what is highlighted as we select. Now, the next big thing we have is snapping. I could actually teach an entire lecture on snapping, but since we haven't even talked about manipulating objects yet, I'm just going to give you sort of the, the glance once over. This allows you to snap objects to various things like the grid or to a curve or to other vertices. It's very nice when you need precise motion, and we can talk about snapping a little bit later. Now, moving on from here, the next major button that I want you to be aware of, and more problems in my particular in my history, haha, uh, have been caused by this one button than anything else. So if you forget everything about the status line, which you shouldn't, the status line is very important, but this one button can cause you more grief if you forget about it than anything else. And this is the construction history button. When this is off, Maya is no longer calculating construction history. Now that sounds like no big deal at first. And if you're just modeling a few things every now and then, it may be no big deal to you. It might be just fine. However, later on, once you get into animating or trying to rig up characters or skin things, the ability for uh, Maya to use construction history is critical. And I have had people install Maya multiple times just trying to figure out why stuff isn't working, when the whole time they just had the construction history button off. So definitely make sure you remember this button. Uh, I'll give you a heads up. In my 10 or more years of using Maya, I have never needed to turn this button off, not ever. I'm not saying you couldn't, but I've never actually had to turn it off. So that's definitely, definitely something for you to think about. Uh, we have access to our render view. So the last thing we rendered, which is nothing right now because we haven't rendered anything, we can render stuff. Hey, look, there's a render. Uh, we have two different renders. We have just the standard render, which you just saw, and we have the IPR render, which is interactive, meaning we can make changes to our scene and they'll update in... I want to say mostly real-time. It's not as real-time as you might be used to if you do things like in, uh, in Unreal Engine 3 or Unity, for example. But it's pretty close to real-time, and it's kind of a neat trick. I don't use it that much anymore. It used to be a lot cooler several years ago, but now it's just kind of like, eh, whatever. Uh, we have the render settings window. If you need to change anything about how your render is working or about which render you are using, uh, some of you may have heard uh, different buzzwords like uh, mental ray or Maya vector or anything like that. And this is where you go to change those settings for the render you want to use. Now, we'll throw this out there for you beginners. Uh, if you look in the render using section and you want to switch this to mental ray, and for some reason you don't see mental ray like I don't right now, that's because the mental ray plugin has not been active. Activated. So take a note. You can go under Window, Settings Preferences, and jump down to the Plugin Manager. And buried in this list of plugins that come along with Maya, and this is actually a lot like uh, Blender's very similar system, uh, but you will find uh, right in here, somewhere right in front of me, I'm probably staring right at it, uh, we have the Maya to MR plugin. And if you guys see it and, and I don't, then that's hilarious. Where is the mental ray plugin? I promise I should be staring right at it. D tell me if you guys see it, because I'm not seeing it all of a sudden. It's not there. Well, I'll be damned. Well, I'll figure that out here in just a minute, because it just sounds like Maya's being a little silly. It's at the, is it at the bottom? Did they bury it in the, at the bottom? 
Ha <laughs> ha! They did. Mental Ray plugins loaded and auto load. I think I would normally see it, but because I just installed the bonus tools like the other day, and there's all this bonus tools crap in the way, so I'm not used to seeing that. So now I've turned on Maya to MR, and I can go ahead and click close. And now if I go over to the render settings, check it out. Render using, aha, uh -huh, we can now render with Mental Ray, and we get all those cool settings we can play with, like uh, global illumination and all that fun stuff that we're not going to talk about right now. Now, next to this, we have a field where we can enter in various numbers to move stuff around. Uh, and we'll talk about this when we get to actually manipulating objects in 3D space, but this is where you can go to actually punch in the coordinates you want to move something. You can do this in absolute or relative space. So that is a rundown of the status line. Again, its whole job is just to tell you what state Maya is currently in. That's the biggest thing I want you to remember about the status line. Okay, now, moving down from here, we have the shelf. The shelf is what you can consider to be your typical application toolbar. But it's got so many buttons that it's actually been divided up into tabs. So think of it just like a regular tab toolbar. If you don't know what any of the buttons do, don't worry about it. Just mouse over them and they will probably tell you. Uh, we have things like on the, the polygons shelf here, we have you know, create a polygon sphere or a polygon torus, uh, subdivision proxy mode. We have things like various t uh, commands like extrude or bridge or chamfer, etc. and so forth. You can add things to the shelf. You actually get access by default to a custom shelf, and you've, you see I've already got some Mel scripts in here that I've put, uh, put in here myself. The shelf on the far left-hand side, if you click on this little tiny triangle, uh, it has the shelf editor that you can go to. And this looks a little scarier than it really is. Um, but if you, if you take a moment and just look at it and, and read over it, it's not that bad. Uh, but we have access to all of our different shelves as well as all of the commands that are inside of them. If you really wanted to, uh, you could open up this shelf editor right now. And there's this little button. It looks like the sun rising over a little piece of paper. I don't know why that suggests new anything to anybody, but, you know, whatever. Uh, we'll go ahead and click on New Shelf. And that created a shelf called Shelf Layout 1, which I don't like that name. We're going to call this Zach Shelf. And there's Zach Shelf. So now I can take this shelf and I can move it down. So I'm just going to keep hitting the down button until it goes to the very far end. And we'll just click Save All Shelves. So check it out. I now have my own shelf that does nothing. Uh, it, there's nothing in it. If I want to add stuff to it, I have a couple of options. I could, and this is uh, this is generally, you know, I would call this outside the scope, but you know, just for the fun of it, we could write a mel script like sphere, and then hit uh, the semicolon. That's actually a mel script. We can press enter, and that creates a little nerb sphere. How awesome is that, really? And watch this. If I go back here to the mel line, you saw where I typed that in. If you didn't, I'm going to type it in again. So watch this. I'm going to hit delete and nuke out the sphere. Let's go back down here to mel. Let's type in sphere one more time, and I like putting my terminator at the end, like a good little programmer and press enter, and you see what that does. But if you hit the up arrow key, you can see the command that you use last. If you highlight this little line of script, you can middle mouse drag it right up on top of the shelf and let go. And check it out. Save script to shelf as type, mel or python. That's a mel command, everybody. So I click on mel, and now check it out. I have a button on the shelf that whenever I click it will make a sphere. So that's kind of how the shelf works. Now, there's another way to use the shelf as well. If uh, you have something that you know the location of in the menu, you can uh, create a button on your shelf for, directly from the menu. So all you got to do, let's say I want to make a cone now. I'm going to hold down Control and Shift. Once again, that's Control and Shift. And go to Create, Polygon Primitives, and let's make a cone. And there you go, right there on the shelf. It didn't actually make a cone, but it added that button to the shelf. So now I can click on it, and I get to drag out a cone. If you create a button that you don't want anymore, you can just middle mouse drag it to this tiny little trash can on the far right-hand side, and now it goes away. So there you go. There's a quick rundown of how the shelf editor works. It's just a way for you to make your own buttons that do stuff if you need to do that. Okay, so... Moving down from here, are there any questions so far about anything we've covered? Probably not. This is all pretty straightforward stuff, and hopefully it's demystifying at least some of the user interface for you. Because really, everything up to this point is pretty basic, pretty straightforward. It looks scarier than it really is. On the left-hand side, we have the toolbox. 
This is just quick access to some of the primary tools that you're going to use. I'll give you a tip. I practically never use this. As a matter of fact, if I was actually using Maya like I usually do, one, I would have my monitor at a much higher resolution, but I can't do that for these webinars. But I always have the toolbox hidden, and that's just me. I'm not telling you you have to hide it. I'm not telling you that the toolbox is bad or useless or that you shouldn't use it. I'm just telling you that I don't use it, and I'll show you why. Toolbox gives you access to some of the primary tools, like the Select tool to allow you to select objects, which is very useful. The Lasso tool, if you need to draw a lasso around things to select them, of course, that's very fancy. The Paint Selection tool, if you want to paint uh, what you do and do not have selected. Also very cool and fancy, but we're not going to worry about that right now. I'm going to press F8, well, actually Q, and then F8 to get out of there. Or go back to the Select tool if you want to click on stuff. You have access to the Move, Rotate, and Scale tools. We'll talk about those when we get to interacting with 3D objects a little bit later. We have one of the tools that I actually kind of don't like. Um, I really don't like, I'll be honest. Uh, the Universal Manipulator. What this does, this draws a box around your objects, and it allows you to do fun things like, uh, like scale them or rotate them and all kinds of fun stuff without having to jump between different tools, but I don't like it, and I'll explain why a little later. Uh, we have the soft modification tool. I'm not going to even show it to you right now because that functionality is actually built into the move tool these days. I haven't touched this in years now. And then we have the show manipulator tool, which we don't even need. So really a lot of these tools are stuff that are either kind of edge case that you probably don't need that often or they are bound to hotkeys and I'll mention these hotkeys once and then I'll mention them again later but if you want to select stuff if you just want to make selections the key for accessing the select tool is Q up the top left corner of most of your keyboards then if you want to move something so that, that's for just selecting if you want to move something the move tool is on W the Rotate tool is on E, the Scale tool is on R, and the Show Manipulator tool is on T. And you won't use the Show Manipulator tool right away. We'll actually get to that a little bit later. So, Q, W, E, R, T. So Q for Select, W for Move, E for Rotate, R for Scale, T for Show Manipulator. Now, if that sounds vaguely familiar to you, maybe you are a Unity user, maybe you're a 3DS Max user, uh, the reason that it is so familiar is that Maya basically had it first and uh, other people started copying it. Uh, y, yes, will also do the last command if you want. And we could just sit there and start going down the keyboard and spouting off hotkeys, but we're not going to right this minute. Okay, so uh, there is a rundown of the toolbox. Now, the toolbox has some other functionality as well. It allows you to control your viewport. If you want to look at a single view, you can click this to go to a four view. Or the button, which you can probably see more buttons than I can if you're running a higher resolution. I can't see that many uh, because I'm at such a low resolution. Uh, this opens up the outliner and the perspective view. The outliner is kind of like a view of the scene hierarchy. Basically, all objects in the scene are listed here. And then, of course, we have the Help button, or actually just open up the Autodesk website button. If for some reason you want to know more about Maya while you use Maya, there's a button specifically for that, because that's not a wasteful use of the interface, is it? Okay, so uh, there is the toolbox. Are there any questions about the toolbox? It's pretty standard. And really, again, I never click on it. In fact, most of the time, I have it hidden. Uh, just for the record, if you want to hide things on the interface, and we'll talk about doing this in a little bit, but I'll give you kind of a, a preview of that. You see these little dot patterns that are kind of all over the place? There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. You can use these to drag around pieces of the interface if you want to. Uh, so you see, I just kind of restructured my... Uh, my shelf a little bit so it went in a different location. You can grab and drag these and position them wherever you might want them. So Maya's user interface has actually become quite a bit more flexible than it used to be back in the day. However, if you right click on those little dot patterns, you can turn stuff off. So if you know you're never going to need the toolbox, uncheck it and suddenly you have no toolbox. You just opened up a little more room, which is very nice. I like additional, uh, additional room. But since I'm teaching a class, I'll go ahead and just kind of leave it there, at least for the time being. Okay, now, before we get too far away, there is something I wanted to mention about the menu bar that I didn't mention, so if you guys will pardon me having to jump back just a little bit. 
Uh, there is something that is very fancy about the menu bar that you don't get in most applications, and that is the ability to tear off a menu. Anytime you are looking at a menu, you see this little dotted line here at the top of any of your menus? If you click on this, you get a, t a tear off version of that menu, which is really nice for building your own interfaces if you're doing something that you know you're going to have to dig into the menu a lot for. Uh, you can just tear it off and have a floating copy of it whenever you need it. So for instance, if I know I'm going to be creating a lot of polygon objects, I can go under polygon primitives and then just tear off this little guy here and I can click on cone and make a cone. I can click on torus and make torus. I can click on prism and make prism. All by having that floating right there. When I'm done, just close it. No problem. Uh, how can I make Maya res higher, I, uh, or do I need a bigger screen? A change your screen resolution is a good one. Um, I personally don't think you can have too big of a monitor. Is there a button for the brush select? You know, if there is, I don't really know what it is off the top of my head. I think I remember asking myself that a long time ago, and that may be one of the only things that I ever actually have to reach over and click on the toolbox for, but I don't often use brush select. I have, but I don't often. So, uh, yeah, again, if there's a hotkey for that, then off the top of my head, I don't know what it is. But that's probably true of a lot of hotkeys in Maya. There's probably a lot of hotkeys that I just don't get a chance to use. It's one of those personal preference things. Okay, so that takes us to the toolbox. Now, I'm actually going to jump over the viewport because the viewport is a monster. It's its own discussion worth of stuff that we're not going to get into right now. Uh, I'm going to take you all the way across over to the channel box. The purpose of the channel box is to give you access to animatable attributes. I'm going to say that again. The purpose of the channel box is to give you access to animatable attributes. Whenever you hear the term channel in Maya, you should think animation, because that's what it's talking about, animated channels. Uh, what is a channel? Well, it's a, singly, a singular property that can have an animation curve applied to it. So, for instance, we could take the translate Y of an object and animate it wavering and have that object moving up and down because that is an animatable channel. So anything that you can animate on an object is visible inside the channel box. That's the big thing you need to know. That's why this is here. Now, uh, let's see. Now, underneath the channel box, or kind of with a, the tab next to it, we have the attribute editor. This is different than the channel box in that it gives you access to all of the attributes of a given object, not just those that are animatable. So even stuff that can't be animated, such as the tessellation attributes of a particular object, or things about its tangent space, a lot of deep level stuff that you may not always need to use. Uh, I'm seeing a couple of things pop up over in the, the list. We have uh, G is last command. G is actually the last command, and Y is the last tool that you used, if you just want to know the difference. Sorry, you, you kind of taunted me into that one. Now, here inside the attribute editor, you'll notice this is a tabbed layout, and I'm going to mention this, and if it doesn't resonate within you and you don't entirely get it, do not panic. But I'm going to say it so that you've heard it once. Each one of these tabs represents a different node that makes up this object. Every object in Maya is a list of nodes. It is the culmination of a series of nodes that come together to build that object. So that's what you need to be aware of. And here inside the attribute editor, you have access to each one of the nodes that makes this object what it is. So definitely be aware of that. And again, the big difference between the attribute editor and the channel box is what? Anybody over in BuzzNet? Who wants, who wants a cookie inside of BuzzNet? Tell me what the difference is between the channel box and the attribute editor. Jen says animation. I mean, that's close enough. But be more specific. Type something more than just one word if you want a cookie. Keyable, just one word again. Not helping me. All non keyable attributes and non key. You guys are just, you're floundering. Channel is animatable, attributes are nodes. That's probably the closest one. Channel box has animatable parameters. Okay, I think all of you get some cookie crumbs, okay? Everybody who answered gets some bits and pieces of cookie that may or may not have pocket lint in them, okay? That's as fair as I can be. So, and if you just want a cookie, then uh, Famous Amos, that's who I recommend, um, basically. The answer is that the channel box contains all of the animatable attributes for a selected object. The attribute editor gives you access to all of its attributes across all of the different nodes that make up that object. 
Because this object, like this sphere that we're looking at right here, it's more than just a singular object in terms of Maya's architecture. There's the p-sphere one node, there's, and that's, uh, what that, that's an input node. We have the shape node. We have its transform node. We have its initial shading group. And we have the material that's applied to it. So we have all these different nodes that are working in conjunction to give us this object right here in this space that looks like that. And if you don't have a tab for the attribute editor, all you need to do is move your mouse up here to the status line and there's this tiny little button that says show or hide the attribute editor. Because if you don't have that on, you'll notice you don't get any tabs. So click on that button and suddenly you get tabs and you can jump in between the two. And there you have it. So there's the big difference between the channel box and the attribute editor. So now let's jump downstairs real quick. We have the time slider. Until we get into animation, I don't expect you to know much about this or how it works, but really what this does, it allows you to jump from frame to frame or from time signature to time signature so that you can place keyframes and create animation. That will become more clear when we actually get to animating. For now, just know that you need this to know at what particular time you're looking at in your view. So if you want to look at what's going on at frame 30, you need to move this to 30. You also have your play controls here that allow you to play through your animation, which is playing really fast right now. You can play backwards, which is more useful than you probably think it is. You can jump between each one of your keyframes and do all, basically other ways to control what time you're sitting at. But since we're not animating right now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. You can also punch in exactly what time you want to go to. So now we're at frame 20 because I typed that in. Or I can go to frame 15 if I so desired. Underneath the time slider, we have what is called the range slider. And the range slider gives you the ability to control what frames you're looking at in the time slider. Think of it like a way to zoom and focus the time slider just directly above it. So currently, the range slider says we are looking at frames between 1 and 24. We can grab this handle and we can stretch that out and now we're looking between frames 1 and 48. Or I can grab this handle and shrink it down and now we're looking between 35 and 48. So we focus down, it's like we've zoomed in a little bit. And then I can grab this bar and start to move it along the timeline. So I'm looking at this tiny little segment of frames and I can slide that up and down the entire timeline. Now you also have some text entry fields or some number entry fields to be more specific on the uh, uh, that go along with the range slider. The outermost fields tell you the start and end frames of your entire animation. So right now we're going between 1 and 48. The inner fields tell you what your range slider is currently set at. So currently that's set to go between 23 and 36. And you'll notice as I slide the range around, those numbers update. Uh, how do you set the UI to default? Well, it depends on what you've done with it. Uh, if you've done a lot of really crazy things, you're probably going to want to go into your uh, your Maya temp file. I'm sorry, under um, if you're a Windows user, which I'm just going to have to assume that you are. Uh, if you go under your Documents folder, you should see a Maya folder, and there's a Maya Prefs folder. You can delete that and then restart Maya, and everything goes right back to uh, its original defaults. So that's one way to do it, uh, if you've really, really, really messed a lot of things up. Okay, so now, next, we have the mel command line, or the Python command line, depending on what it is you want to do. So you can click on this and set it between Python and mel. This is really just a command line. You can type in commands in here, as we've already seen. So we typed in sphere. We should be able to, can we type cube as well? I'm pretty sure we can. No, there's not a procedure for cube. We have to type, I think it's polycube. But let's just go with sphere because it's real easy in one word. You'll notice a couple of things happen. On the left-hand side, you have the commands that you can enter. On the right-hand side, you get feedback. This is the result from Maya's uh, command engine telling you, yes, the result is we created NURB sphere 2 that has a shape node called make NURB sphere 2. So that's what that's for. And down from here, we have the helpline. The helpline is here just to help you understand what you should be doing at any given moment. So currently, we have the select tool active, and it says select an object. So I guess that's what we should be doing. If we switch over to the move tool, which, once again, as a review, is done with the W key, then you can see that it tells you to uh, use the manipulator to move your objects around. So there is the entirety of the visible Maya user interface, and there sure is a lot to it. 
Uh, I only see my objects in wireframe when I'm in poly mode. How do I change that? Well, uh, hit the 5 key on your keyboard. We'll actually talk about different ways you can view the viewport here in just a little bit. Um, that is coming soon. Uh, but if you want to see stuff in solid form, hit the 5 key, and that will solidify all of your objects by smooth shading them. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? Uh, so he says, it doesn't seem to be updating. Please try to give me uh, complete sentences, because it is really vague. So I'm more than willing to help you, but I don't know what it is. And if it is not updating, I mean, it could be the entire interface, it could be the channel box, it could be the viewport. Tell me what is not updating, and I will help you. I'm thinking it's probably the viewport. Help message is not updating. I wouldn't necessarily worry too much about that, but uh, have you tried switching between different tools and seeing if it says anything? Because I've never actually seen the help message not update for some reason, unless I've got it switched off, because honestly, uh, these days I fight for every last ounce of... Uh, of real estate space I can get, so more often than not, I've got that hidden. So, not only does it not update on my end, I don't even see the thing. Stuck on select tool, select an object, I'm using the move tool. I really don't know why that would be, and that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever, other than your particular Maya is being just a little bit finicky, maybe because of something going on with your computer. But I can't think of any setting that would cause the helpline to start acting stupid. So really, in the end, your helpline is just acting stupid. I wouldn't stress about it too much. Okay, so that is a rundown of... Everything up to the viewport. So what we're going to do, because we're actually a little bit over an hour on this first part of the class, we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then when we come back, we will start by taking a look at the Maya viewport, and then we will move on from there to a few of the other primary uh, concepts that I want you to know for this week's class, and that will be about it. So let's go ahead and take a quick break. <laughs>